Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. privilege to be here. This is uh, my passion when I get to speak to any group of people. Age doesn't matter. I love doing this. My goal today, like it is any other day when I do a talk, is that each one of you may leave with a little more knowledge than you had before you came in about insects and arachnids. Uh, that's my purpose. Without them, we would not survive. And human beings have a rough time agreeing to that. And by the way, we don't have to worry about that. We'll, long, we'll disappear long before insects do. So I'm going to talk about my favorite order of insects. It happens to be butterflies and moths. And the first one I'm going to talk about is this guy right here in the middle. This is an atlas moth. For years I was asked what insect in the world is the largest. And for years I said this one was. This is actually number two. Uh, there's the bird wing, Queen Alexander bird wing from Indonesia that is larger. Uh, it's a 12, it has a 12 inch wingspan. This is the atlas moth. It's about eight inches. Something that's really interesting and it's a protection for this guy. If you'll look at these closely there's an eye spot on the end of each wing and each wing looks like an asp, like a snake. Its head is, and that, that's a huge protection for this guy. Of course, the size is also a protection. There aren't a lot of things that prey on him. One of the things that's interesting about in, insects, butterflies and moths, is that they have scales on their wings, and that's the most difficult thing about collecting insects, especially butterflies and moths. Those scales aren't permanent. A man found a letter F in the Smithsonian Institution in 1995. He spent seven years, traveled to all the continents, and photographed these. He captured the moth or butterfly, photographed the letter, and released them. Those colors are all contained in something called scales. And to spread a wing out of a butterfly or moth is a really delicate. My wife always says that she wishes I had as much patience with other things as I do this because it takes a long time to do this. Uh, to do this, you, if you're going to put it in your collection, you put an insect pin through the body, the thorax, and then you spread the wings out and hold them down with strips of paper and pins. If you don't leave them in there long enough, the wings on a butterfly in particular will fold back up again. So I leave these for a good long while. And I just captured this one on a, actually it was dead along the road when I took a bicycle ride. But this is to illustrate what a, a spread board is. And you don't need, some people will make spreading boards out of real fancy lumber. Egg carton works just fine. Been using them for 50 years. So what I'm going to do is pass out some, some insects now, and these all have really interesting characteristics, and I'm going to highlight some of the characteristics. I'm going to start with the blue morpho. This is a butterfly in Central and South America. Uh, many entomologists have written their thesis on, their doctoral thesis on this butterfly. The blue morpho is really interesting because when flying through the rainforest, if sun reflects on their wings, they look like a mirror flying through the rainforest. I happened to see one of these in Costa Rica. Of course, it was one of the highlights of my life, in my opinion, because I never dreamed I'd see a blue morpho. But on the back, and the reason this is broken, I dropped it uh, doing a presentation once. But this is a really great illustration of camouflage. When this butterfly lands, and always in most cases, when butterflies land, they fold their wings together. If it's a moth, usually their wings are spread. So it's a one, one way to distinguish a butterfly from a moth because a lot of moths actually fly during the day. 
So this guy, when it lands, it folds its wings up. It'll land on a, a tree that has similar colored bark. And unless it moves, nothing sees it, period. So it's not going to be a meal until it moves. And uh, in many cases in Costa Rica, it'll end up being a lizard or something similar. <clears throat> this is another blue morphal species. This guy is not quite as brilliant as he, but his defense is one that is common with butterflies. And of course, this atlas moth had an eye spot on one wing. This one has eight eye spots on each pair of wings, four on each wing. Eye spots protect the insect because something that might want this as a meal looks at it and says, that's a pretty dangerous creature because it has eight eyes. Uh, that's somewhat true. Uh, although it isn't dangerous, they don't know that. So again, Mother Nature has some really interesting protections for these things that are so delicate and fragile. This is a tiger swallowtail. Uh, I captured this in Buena Vista probably, I don't even know if I put the year, but this was in the 50s. So it's, this guy's been in here a long time. Uh, the reason I kept it, when I captured it, I rubbed this wing. And when you see it, you'll see that I rubbed all the scales off. It became a transparent membrane. And that's what happens when they, and this occurs with them in Mother Nature as well. They, they can get uh, roughed up with a tree or a, a bush if they get blown into something. And so they can lose scales. And they don't grow back. They don't grow back. No, they're, they're going to, and if you see a butterfly without scales on its wings, you're going to notice that they're gone, and they're gone permanently. This, this one is uh, one that's called a paperweight. That's the common name. And by the way, I don't use anything but common names. Uh, most of you sitting here today aren't going to become entomologists, and you don't need to know a scientific name. And that most of the people whom I speak before don't need scientific names to me. They're not important. It's better to remember something with a common name because it's a lot easier to remember. Latin is not something we all know, so I don't worry about that. This, this one I also dropped, and I was going to toss it away. The teacher said, do not do that. It's a good illustration of how fragile the wings can be for a specimen that has been collected. Because when it hit, I was in a gymnasium doing, uh, I think, about 75 first graders, and it fell to the floor. and fell apart. Uh, and that's a good illustration of that. This is a photo frame of in insects, butterflies, from Papua New Guinea. My wife found this in an ark store. And she, she and a lot of other people, when they see something, they bring them to me. So a lot of the things that I pass out are things that people have given me. This is a great illustration of wing shape differentiation, and also colors. The colors are unbelievable. To me, they are, at least, uh, especially in this one. It's just, uh, and I actually captured a moth in Florida that has beautiful colors as well. Not quite like that. But so all these have been spread and dried before mounting. They were all spread and dried before mounting. Um, and in most cases, these are perfect. You'll see in my collection that a lot of them are not perfect. And in fact, I put some in my collection on purpose for that reason. I have a painted lady that looks pretty bad because I found it on a bike ride, but it, it's to illustrate what happens to these things and that their lives uh, in many cases are very short. Even if they live their full lifespan, the, it, they, the lifespan can be really short. These are swallowtails, tiger swallowtail, probably an eastern swallowtail, but we have two in Colorado. We have the tiger swallowtail and the two-tailed tiger swallowtail. This is not a two-tailed, and this is a zebra. And actually, that was given to me by somebody that was raised here in Longmont. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite frames. Um, the reason it's one of my favorite is I, as a, after I started collecting insects when I was about 14, one of my dreams was to and I actually dream, and I still dream about insects. I'm not sure why, but it's, it's really, and they're beautiful. My dreams are usually beautiful. But I would dream about the Luna Moth. The Luna Moth is one that lives in most of the United States, but not in the western United States. These were uh, 
captured by a friend who works graveyard shifts in Indiana. And the cocoon is down here, and cocoons contain the moth. Chrysalis contains the butterfly. This shows why these guys survive. This is in some kind of setting on the ground, and you would never see it. So the adult moth hatches out of these. By the way, the uh, teachers buy these moths as a larva. Frequently, they don't hatch. In fact, that's what happened with these two. A teacher gave me these larvae, and they never hatched. But these were captured in Indiana. This is Cecropria moth, largest moth that lives in the United States. And more than likely, this is as big as they ever get. So I was really thrilled when I got this. This is a polyphemus moth. We have these in Colorado. This is an Io moth. We have these in Colorado, but these all came from Indiana. So telling people that you collect insects can really add to your collection and has, in fact, added a lot to mine. These are butterflies and moths that I, I have captured. These two on top are called the Glover silk moth. I do a lot of bike riding, as Don and Barb know, and I've got some of my best specimens in the fall of the year. Insects have a pretty small brain, but they're not as dumb as we think they are. Uh, they will sit on the side of a blacktop when it's cool in the fall to s absorb heat. And so I've captured a lot of these when I've been on the side of a highway riding my bicycle, and I always have something to put them in. And so I captured this one that way. This one is with the wings upside down. These are the outer wings, this is the under wings, or the inner wing. These are all butterflies from Florida. You don't need anything special. In fact, you'll notice I didn't bring a net. I've captured very few of mine with a net. Uh, but they were alive when you captured them? These, all of these in this were, yes. I, I, and again, now one of these, one of the uh, Glover silk moss was given to me by a teacher. Uh, her husband had caught it. Now, there are always exceptions in the insect world, and we talked about scales on butterflies and moths. This is called a clear wing butterfly. And if you'll notice, very few scales. There's a little down on these wings, and they're very insignificant. Again, this is a protection. When something seeds this, they look right through them because they're clear, their wings are clear. There's another one called the, the glass wing butterfly. The only difference is they glow a little more. They shine like glass. These don't. And of course, one of the reasons I love insects is they come in all shapes and all sizes. And this one is one that I really love. Because I've spoke in schools for 39 years, I have teachers that go to different places in the world, and they always, and one teacher in particular, always brought me something. This is a leaf beetle from Thailand. Again, an incredible protection because unless this beetle moves, it's the exact same shape and color as the leaves on the tree which it inhabits. So, phenomenal protection. So, many of these can live their entire life, which may be weeks or a couple of months, but they're really amazing. And, of course, when I do talks for kids, they love these. But some are so terrified of them that they will not even touch the frame. Uh, these are obviously totally harmless. Um, and tarantulas, in most cases, are somewhat harmless anyway. They you should bikes. be seeing them this time of year across the bike path. A absolutely. Absolutely. Don's absolutely right. This is, this is um, mating migration. He's absolutely right. And we do have them in Colorado. A lot of people don't believe we have tarantulas. We do. I only saw one uh, in Colorado Springs in our home. It was in the window well. It was the only one I saw in 44 years there, but they're there. Uh, we just don't see them. Now, the tarantula has a lot of different species, and uh, they're very interesting. Some, there's one species that preys on hummingbirds, and of course, if that was the only way they were going to survive, they might not survive, so they frequently do not. Uh, their diet is not just hummingbirds, obviously, a lot of other things, but they're large enough to capture a hummingbird. There is a praying mantis, and I'm going to show you praying mantises in a minute, that actually preys on hummingbirds as well. Praying mantises are pretty interesting creatures. This is from the Dominican Republic, and again, somebody gave me that. 
Now, I did want to illustrate one thing before I start talking about insects in every one of these, and I'll, make, uh, I'll talk about something in each case probably. This probably is the heaviest of all insects in the world. It's called a rhinoceros beetle uh, from Costa Rica. I didn't take this picture. It was actually the hand is uh, the hand of a teacher whose class I spoke for for years, and she brought this back when she went to Costa Rica. Quite interesting. Uh, very few insects are really, really harmful. Uh, we think they are. In many cases, that's why I speak to adult groups and to children, uh, because so many times we will kill things if we're not familiar with what they are, and they look threatening, and they, usually they aren't. And I'm going to point that out with a couple of other things that will really... Okay, I think that's all we were going to pass out. <clears throat> okay, what I'm going to do is start with this case. Uh, there's a couple of things in here that I want to point out. One is the Indonesian stag beetle. I've never purchased a beetle. I did this one. I bought this at a jewelry store in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I loved it so much. It was beautiful. They're beautiful. Uh, really quite spectacular. And you'll get to see these up close and personal a little later. This guy is uh, a scorpion species that lives here in Colorado. And uh, I'm going to ask a question about scorpions, but we'll wait until we get to this next uh, box. This is a hobo spider. There are three spiders native to Colorado that are poisonous, uh, that have venom that can... None of them really kill us. There are two spiders in the world that are fatal to mankind out of 30, 35,000 species that have been identified. One is the wandering spider in Brazil. The other is the funnel web spider in Australia. And they are... If you get bitten by either one of them, you're probably not going to survive unless you might have antivenom on you because death can occur within half an hour. So, but those are the only two. And none of us are going to run into those, and not a lot of people in either one of those countries are killed by those. But the hobo spider can raise a welt. This is the wolf spider. Again, this was brought to me by a customer. Uh, of course, most of these things were brought in dead because they were frightened of what they were bringing me. This one had just died, so I was able to spread its uh, legs out and show the size of it. Wolf spiders are really valuable. They eat mites and other things within our homes that really makes them valuable. Uh, another thing that I will... Uh, you heard the cicadas this year. This is a cicada. I've got them in several, several boxes. This is one of my favorites, and the reason it is, I was digging a flower bed up where we lived in Colorado Springs, and I came across this caterpillar. It was about this long, a brown color similar to the earth that I was digging up. I put it in a cottage cheese container and with debris from the flower bed, and within two days, it made this cocoon. Now that's a good illustration again as to why this underwing moth hatched out of that. They're totally protected until the adult hatches. And my wife and I kept hearing this fluttering in our house and we thought it was a mouse in the wall and I kept looking for it everywhere. It was this moth that had hatched inside the cottage cheese container. So uh, it hatched fairly quickly. Something that I really am thrilled that I have in my collection, and I wouldn't have this, my nephew is a firefighter. He fights forest fires, and he was fighting the forest fire in Arizona. I don't remember what year it was, but he had this, this spider wasp fly into him one day when he was in the, the forest. And uh, he called me that night and said, what do you think that is, Uncle Russ? And I said, well, it's most likely a spider wasp. He had captured it. I said, send it to me, Quentin. So he sent it to me. It is. Spider wasps are very specialized creatures. They sting the abdomen of a tarantula or trapdoor spider. And by the way, they win 100 times out of 100. They, the abdomen of spiders that they prey on is soft. Their stinger can penetrate that re really easily. They paralyze their prey. It doesn't kill them. It paralyzes them. They weave a web around it, and when the eggs that they lay hatch, they have a live meal because 
the spider is simply paralyzed, not really dead. So they have a live, uh, a live meal when they, are, when they hatch. So they're very interesting. These are clicking cockroaches from Madagascar. When you come up, uh, you'll get to see their eyes. Uh, we are all fooled by what their eyes, where we think their eyes are, they're actually down underneath. And again, a protection. So the great thing about collecting insects in Colorado is that we have a perfect climate. It's dry, not humid. In Florida, I would have to put these in a, some kind of a humidity controlled room. But here, I've never used anything. So it's perfect. So I'm fortunate that I grew up in this state because you can really collect insects and not have to worry about how well they uh, survive. Okay, this box is one that I really love as well because I have praying mantises. This is an African praying mantis. This was given to me by this one and this one were given to me by a guy I worked with at Safeway. He loved strange pets. Uh, these are strange to say the least. Uh, when they died, he brought them to me. Uh, this is one that was found on a playground. Praying mantises are unofficially protected worldwide. And they come in all shapes and all colors and, and different kinds of uh, shapes, to say the least. There's one in uh, South America that preys on hummingbirds. It's pink, white with spots. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, a hum if you were a hummingbird, you wouldn't think it's gorgeous because they are so well camouflaged, the hummingbird does not realize they're there until it's too late. There's a praying mantis in Morocco that lives in the desert that preys on mice. And so insects can be dangerous to more than just other insects. They can be dangerous to a lot of different things in the world. The dragonflies <coughs> are right here. I, this is where I like to ask questions. <coughs> we see dragons everywhere, but do, where do you think their main habitat is? Anybody have a guess? I thought it was around water. That's exactly right. It is. They hatch near water, and so their importance to us derives from what they eat. So what would most of you think they might eat? Mosquitoes and larvae. And the reason they're so important is they exist all over the planet, except in Antarctica uh, and the Arctic. So they exist all over the planet. They are one of the controls, natural controls, for mosquitoes. Because mosquitoes still kill more human beings every year in the world than anything else, including man killing man. Uh, We've brought it down to about 600,000 a year now, and that's through different methods. The Methodists actually have a, a program called NETS that we do with the, the National Basketball Association. And it's controlled mosquitoes in a lot of African countries, and they now have a way to protect themselves from these. But dragonfly is one of the natural enemies. Okay, these, these two guys, this one came from Florida. This is an Asian scorpion. Here's another question. If you were to be bitten by a scorpion, would you rather be bitten by one that's large or small? Large. <laughs> that's a guess. It's <laughs> the right guess. A lot, of, a lot of students actually get this right, but sometimes it's because they've seen a film on them or they've talked to a parent or somebody else. The larger the scorpion, the, more, the less harmful the venom. Part of the reason is this guy up here has claws like an, a lobster, and they can grab and hold onto their prey and repeatedly sting them. This one doesn't have quite that ability, even though it does have claws. It, does, it can't sting it as many times. There's one down here that I always point out because people in Colorado have never seen them in many cases, but we all have them. We have them in our garages, in our closets, in our basements. It's called a wind scorpion or a vinegar roan or a false scorpion. It doesn't have a tail. But it's a scorpion and it's very aggressive. The bite is not one that's going to kill you, but it's not fun to have one bite you. So I've never tried that out, but uh, they really are. They're, they're everywhere. Very common. And I don't know, let's see, is there anything else I need to talk about in this one? I don't think so. These, 
These grasshoppers I found in the fall of the year they were mating. And one question I do ask students is, one is a lot larger than the other, which one would be the female? The larger one. The larger one, that's exactly right, because they carry the ova, they carry the eggs. You're a really great audience, by the way. <laughs> okay, I, through the years, I've had teachers that have given me insects. Well, this was one of the most incredible gifts I was ever given. This, this man that collected all of these had about 5,000 in his basement. They were in paper envelopes, in folded pieces of paper of various kinds, newspapers. They were years old. Some of these were 40 years old when I got them. This teacher, this man loved the teacher. She taught both his children, uh, his son and his daughter. And when the daughter left elementary school, he brought 30 of these to, the, to her as a gift. She called me and said, I have no idea what to do with these. And you have to remember, they were all folded up. So I spent a whole summer spreading these wings. I, I actually saved 25 out of 30. So these, were re these are from Ethiopia, Uganda, and Peru. This was a swallowtail. This, to me, is one of the most beautiful of all the insects I have. When you come up front, you'll get to see uh, the spots almost glow. It's just spectacular. Uh, so I'm really glad I have these in my collection. I wouldn't have them otherwise. Now, insects can be kept in various containers. When I started speaking, this was a hobby to me. Still is, by the way. It still is. The reason I started speaking to school kids is that I was able to tell them, you can do this. And I still tell students that. You can do this and you can basically do it for no money involved. That's not the case anymore, by the way. But it was when I started, and it, it can still be a very inexpensive hobby. I started by putting them in cigar boxes. This is not one of the cigar boxes when I, was, I got when I was a kid, by the way, and I'll explain <laughs> this. Uh, but then you could go to a place, they would give you a cigar box. That's not the case anymore. You'll pay 5 to $10 or even more, and I'm not sure what you would pay for this because this is an all-wood cigar box. Uh, I got these on a bicycle ride across Nebraska. The man had 100. It's pretty hard to carry 100 cigar boxes on your bike, so I brought two back. <laughs> but uh, these are perfect. And of course, I really stuff them full because to me, uh, it's a good way to display them, and then I don't need as many containers. Ladybugs is another insect that is really valuable to us. We can buy their eggs as we can buy, just as we can buy praying mantis eggs from seed catalogs. They really are the only natural control for aphids. They don't do a great job because aphids can multiply as much as one can multiply to between 200 and 500,000 in one year. So it's pretty difficult to control them with, with this. And this, this is a black widow. When you come up, I've pinned it upside down. The hourglass has faded. I've, when you ask how I preserve them, the one thing I've tried to preserve is the spiders that, because they don't have an exoskeleton like insects. And so they shrivel up, they fade. The black widows are a beautiful spider. Their bite isn't beautiful, but they're really a beautiful uh, arachnid. So. It's faded, but you can see what it looks like. Uh, they are very common. Another moth that I will point out is this one. This is called the, uh, the white line sphinx moth. You have all seen, well, I shouldn't say that. Most of you have seen the caterpillar that this hatches from. It happens to be the tomato hornworm. My wife to this day hates them all. <clears throat> it took me years to keep her from snipping those caterpillars in two with a garden shear. Uh, She'd just go out, and when she saw one, she, she'd just cut it in two. Uh, I would like to get them and put them in a container and hatch them. Uh, this is a moth that's mistaken for a hummingbird frequently. They, can, they have the same flight patterns. They can do anything that a hummingbird does uh, flight-wise. So they're really interesting creatures. I think also beautiful. There's a lot of different sphinx moths. One of the most beautiful is this one. It's called an Akiman sphinx moth. They're common in Colorado. I also think one of the most beautiful. This is an Asian tiger moth, which 
doesn't show up in Colorado hardly ever. A friend of mine found this in a parking lot in Steamboat Springs and brought it to me and of course I was thrilled and I didn't think I'd ever find out what it was but it actually was in one of my insect guides. These are, uh, no I, I don't know where my fireflies are. We do have fireflies in Colorado in certain locations, not many. I thought that was these, it's not. When I was in Colorado Springs, I would uh, volunteer every year to take guests, and they paid for this. It was one of those things at Fountain Creek Nature Center, and we would take them out through the, the park near dusk and hoped that we'd, we would see fireflies. We did. Each time that I did it, we, did, we were successful. And uh, they're amazing creatures. They have a chemical that lights up when they, and that's how the males attract females with their, and the brighter the light, supposedly, the more likely you are to have a mate. And, uh, so, very interesting. This is an interesting beetle. It's called the Tilehorn prionis, the largest beetle that lives in, in the state of Colorado. Uh, they live in the forests, in, in uh, evergreen forests. They don't really damage the trees they're on. They don't do them any good, but they don't kill them. Like the uh, pine bark beetle, which is I've got a pine bark beetle. And then one other thing I'm going to really talk about in here, I've got several honeybees in here. And by the way, I will not kill a honeybee. The ones I have in my collection I've found dead, or I've been given uh, by somebody that found them dead. I will not kill them. Honeybees are really valuable to us. They're an invasive species. They were not here. Uh, they came over uh, probably on the Mayflower. To our knowledge, at least, they were never here until we came from Europe. The Indians, of course, didn't necessarily like them, but learned to like them when they realized how valuable they are. They are really valuable, and they are, beekeepers now are having a tremendously difficult time keeping their hives alive for a lot of reasons. The government says, well, we don't know why. Well, one of the biggest reasons is our industrial sprays, sprays that we use on crops. The other thing that's interesting about honeybees, and by the way, if we lose the honeybee, estimates put it that we would lose up to 40% of the produce that we see in grocery stores. I'm not sure that's totally accurate because there are tons of different pollinators out there. Uh, but the honeybee in particular is responsible for the almond crop in America. We ship millions of honeybees from various places in the country to California every year. We could solve that if we simply had an area where honeybees could live locally, and we could do that, but that hasn't happened. Uh, I don't think there's much else in here. This, I did have a brown recluse or a fiddlehead spider, which uh, is one that, that's related to the brown recluse, and the brown recluse does show up here, obviously. You can ask questions about some of these when you come up. Okay, this next case, I'm really glad, uh, actually a parent, when I was doing a talk for the community of Fountain, when you knocked this case off the table, it landed upside down, and I was horrified. Uh, actually, she only destroyed, uh, I, I, I don't think any of them got destroyed. A lot of them came unpinned because it was upside down. This is the double-tailed tiger swallowtail. It's the largest that lives in Colorado, we see them. They're pretty common. Mimicry is another thing that we see in the insect world. And this is a bumblebee moth. But things that prey on this don't know that. It looks like a bumblebee. And it's actually in the sphinx moth family. But it looks like a bee. And if you got up close as a human, you would know it's not a bee because it has antenna and bees don't have antenna that are even close to this long. Another insect that I love in this state is the morning cloak. It's the first sign of spring to me, true sign of spring. It hatches early in the spring, and it has the longest lifespan of any butterfly in the state of Colorado. Uh, it, it can live from early spring clear into possibly early December, depending on how cold it gets before December but certainly into October, late October and early November. Incredible butterflies. I would never capture one of these with a net or in any other way. The only reason I have these is one flew into my grill on my car one day on a trip, 
and I knew I had a good, a good insect. I found caterpillars of uh, two others and let them hatch. Uh, I found one hatching out of a chrysalis one day and so captured it. And I did that simply because they're such a unique uh, butterfly. Okay, the oldest case in my collection is this one. I have an ant that was a naturalist in Alaska. And so some of my earliest insects are in this case. And this shows you how well they keep in, in Colorado, Don. Uh, they really... So this started in Buena Vista? This started in Buena Vista in 19... Let's see, I was 14, so it would have been 1958. So yes, and... and uh, not all of these are from that era, but some of them are. The monarch up here on the top and some of the bees. This is one I actually got in Longmont this year. It's called the 12-spotted skimmer. It, uh, a car hit it and knocked it onto the shoulder of the road, and I saw it and turned around went back and got it. This is a walking sick that came from Idaho. Now, the reason I tell you that is when I did a talk for a school up in northern Colorado Springs, a private school, by the way, a wonderful school. The teacher had a whole aquarium full of these. Her mother sends them to her every year, and her class watch it, gets to watch them grow. Well, when I got it, it was about this big. It lived for 18, um, 18 weeks, I believe is what it was. I wrote it down. Let's see. Uh, 12 September to 11 December, so it wasn't 18, but it was a long time. And it grew that much in the time that I had it. People have asked me what I fed it, and she said, please feed it organic romaine lettuce. I didn't feed it organic romaine lettuce. I fed it any kind of lettuce that I had, and it seemed to do okay. <laughs> so you don't have to feed insects organic necessarily. But again, Really an interesting creature. This bee down here, when you see this, this was given to me by a friend that I ride bicycles with. Uh, in fact, I've ridden thousands of miles with him. It's a leaf cutter bee, and it looks like it has fat legs. It does have fat legs, but that's because it has tons of pollen on its legs. When I say tons, it would be tons to us. <clears throat> Three to go, and then we'll let you come up and see these up close and personal. These are from Costa Rica. This is one of my favorite boxes. Uh, when we went to Costa Rica, I was the only person out of 18 that was running around capturing insects and photographing spiders and doing all these weird things as far as everybody there was concerned, including my wife. Uh, this beetle was on a bush. I don't know what species it was, but it was on a bush. A German couple had just walked by it and had jumped and I asked them why they jumped, and they took me back and showed me. I grabbed it and put it in a soap dish. It was the only one of these that was alive when I got back to Colorado. What I did was illegal if I were caught with it. Uh, and I, my, one of my sayings is, uh, you haven't broken the law unless you get caught. <laughs> well, in this, case, in this case, I hadn't broken the law. And by the way, that's to protect us from invasive species. None of these would have survived in Colorado. They were all from a tropical climate. This is one that's really interesting, and you will see that if you go to the Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster. It's called the Owl Eye Butterfly. Its caterpillar preys and eats banana plants. And so Dole and Del Monte, who have plantations in Costa Rica and South America, spray these. The caterpillar's horribly ugly, long and brown, by the way, they'll never kill these off. What they do is they harm the workers that, produce, that, that uh, have to harvest all those bananas. And we toured a place, and I felt horrible for the workers because they probably don't get paid very much, and they're exposed to all the sprays that we use to control these butterflies. It's called owl eye butterfly, obviously, because of the spots on its wings. They look exactly like an owl eye. This was actually a female. I captured her on the, uh, the floor of the, uh, the rainforest in Tortuguero National Park before anybody else was up <laughs> one morning. Dropped my hat over it because it was eating uh, some rotten fruit on the floor of the jungle and put it in a Kleenex in my shaving kit and brought it back and it laid eggs. So it's a female. So I was delighted. 
Insects can be used for various things around the world, but one thing that's common is jewelry, and that's this little weevil is one of the most beautiful insects I have in my collection. I found it on a flower on the rim of a, of a volcano. This is one of my favorite boxes. This also got knocked off by a student, a first grade student in a school that I spoke to every year in, in Colorado Springs. And uh, I didn't realize it, but the bodies of both these moths had been knocked off and I didn't realize they were gone. <clears throat> but I wouldn't throw them away because these are both really good specimens. This is the monarch butterfly, one of my favorite creatures. In fact, when I worked for the uh, volunteered for the Nature Center, you had to tell them what were your most favorite creatures. Well, I have two, the dragonfly, because I think they're just incredible creatures, and the monarch butterfly. We'll never know how these fifth generation, in most cases, get to their resting place in South America, in Mexico. They're fifth generation. That means that butterfly that is flowing there Obviously, they've never been there. Uh, so they're really amazing creatures. The other thing that's interesting about the monarch is we can identify sexes in monarch butterflies without dissecting them or putting them under a, a microscope. This is the male. It has a little black spot right here on one of the lines. That's important, by the way, because it gives off a scent, but it also indicates it's the male. This is the female. These are cockroaches. This is a Dubai cockroach, these are the Madagascar hissing cockroaches, and these are Brazil cockroaches. There's a lady in Colorado Springs that raises these. Uh, she retired as a teacher and gives talks on all kinds of interesting creatures around the city. The reason I love to tell people I collect, I have a daughter-in-law from Japan. She, every time she goes to Hokkaido, I tell her, I would, in fact, she didn't bring me anything this time, that's okay. I saw some pictures of the things, and I wish she could have brought them to me, but she probably couldn't have captured them. But one thing she did bring me was this. This was a dragonfly from Hokkaido, perfect shape. It was being drugged down a sidewalk by ants. And so the ants were going to make this a meal. Uh, they obviously didn't get to. She brushed all the ants off and brought it back to me. The reason I love it is it's larger than anything we have probably in, in the United States. There are dragonflies in other countries that might be larger, but in this case, this is the largest one I have. So truly one of those things I just am really grateful that I have uh, in my collection. And this is one of those that people in southern Colorado in particular, and I don't know how much they raise down there, but beans. This is called a black witch. Its caterpillar likes to eat bean plants, and so they're not fond of them. Because again, they can raise the caterpillar, and that's what we need to remember. As humans, the caterpillars of all these are usually what is destructive, because they have to, and they, they grow. If we grew as quickly as they would be, we'd be the size of a train within months. These things, their caterpillars shed several times before they become a cocoon or a chrysalis. So it's absolutely amazing how quickly they put on weight, but to do that, they have to have food. And food usually is a plant in many cases that we want as a food source ourselves. So this is an interesting moth. Insects have what we call compound eyes. The dragonfly in particular can have I don't know, thousands of iris in one eye, and they do. And they focus, their brain then focuses that into one image when they go to hunt prey or something. But somebody came up with this as a way to illustrate compound eyes. I don't know how well it really illustrates that, but they're interesting. Of course, a lot of times teachers and students want their pictures taken when they have these on, and uh, they're, it's, <laughs> yeah, they're interesting, and I have three pair. You, it's difficult to find these. In every case, I've got these from teachers whose classes I've spoken to. Yes? I understand the value of bees, and I don't kill bees either, but my grandson was, my son was attacked by a swarm of wasps, and everything has a value in nature, but what, what value do wasps have? Well, they are pollinators, but you know, that's a wonderful question, and I'm going to tell you I kill wasps. 
Uh, I have been stung several times, and there are some that, are, that really have a nasty sting. The one I was bit stung by, by the way, just had a horrible sting. It took weeks to heal. Wasps do have purposes, uh, but there's a wasp that came from Japan. It's the Japanese wasp, and I, I think it's probably got a different name, but it came from Japan. They're horribly harmful, and one of the things they actually do is they kill honeybees. They will, they will land on a hive, and they can literally decimate uh, a honeybee colony because they, they know that there's food there. And so they will eat, uh, proceed to eat the honey. So they, their biggest purpose is they are pollinators. Another purpose is they can be eaten by certain creatures, so they're a food source for some, not a lot. Uh, there's a, a bird in Africa, uh, to my knowledge there's not any in Colorado or in the United States probably, that uh, pulls the stinger out of wasps and bees and then eats them without fear of harm. So they can harm anything and do. Uh, they're, they're, uh, one of the things I tell people to do when you're surrounded by a yellow jacket, for instance, because they're the most common one we see when we picnic or outside for a barbecue on our patio, they like anything that's sweet, and when there's activity that attracts them, my advice is stand perfectly still. The more you move, the more it excites them, and the more likely you may get stung. That's not a guarantee. You might still get stung. They're very aggressive, great question. Uh, I'm not a fan of many of them especially when they're an invasive species. And the, the one from Japan is going to kill out a lot of the native species of wasps in Colorado at some point. We're, we're not going to be around to see that, but they will kill, out, kill some of those native species. And they're more aggressive than some of the natives. So great question. People get stung by them every year. When we see a, a hive, we get rid of them. We had one form a hive this, on our patio this year. And, uh, I didn't hesitate to get rid of it and to kill. And then it, they, uh, they formed a hive in uh, something we have on our patio. There was a hole in it, and uh, lo and behold, that's where some of them were coming from. And so I taped it up and sprayed inside it uh, before. This is actually a paper wasp hive, and these get huge. This is just one cone from one. Painted ladies migrate. And that's a good question, and I tried to find that out this year because I've never seen as many painted ladies as I did this year. It's quite a crop. They, they migrate most likely to northern New Mexico. Uh, Mexico. They yes. don't migrate to the area of Mexico that the monarchs migrate to. Painted ladies are the most common butterfly most likely in the world. They primarily have, inhabit the United States, North America. I don't know, I haven't looked it up to see if they inhabit other countries. I don't think they do. They might. Uh, but they, uh, they are used in classrooms all over the country because there are insect supply organizations that have painted lady eggs. They send them. They have containers that the eggs hatch into the larva, the larva grow, and, and then they release the adults when the adults all hatch. And that, by the way, is really successful much more successful than the Luna moths. Some teachers buy the Luna moth eggs, especially here. They would work in other climates across the country, but not here. It's too cold here and too hot, most likely too high as well. So good question. Any other questions? I have a question regarding the praying mantis. I remember as a youngster hearing a story about um, and I think this was in Japan, I'm not sure, um, that a praying mantis would, would have a piece of thread that was tethered to at the head of the bed because it ate insects and that many people actually, and you were talking about a gentleman that had pets. One of them was a praying mantis, the other was a scorpion. And I was wondering, as a pet, um, if he just watched it, or if he utilized it for its mosquito-eating capabilities. 
That could have been. I've not heard a story like that, but I would never say that could not happen and doesn't happen. They're, in, they're docile creatures. I mean, they're not docile if you're an insect or even a bird or a mouse, depending on where you live. Uh, uh, but they are docile. They will, I love them. I've had them cr crawl around my arms. They won't hurt you. And they kill and consume so many different insects in gardens. That's why they're so praised and, and unofficially protected. The other thing that's interesting about praying mantises, and I always use this when I'm talking uh, to kids especially, because this always gets their attention. Uh, I always thank God that I'm a, a male human being and not a male praying mantis. Not all praying mantises, male praying mantises, get consumed after mating, but many do. Uh, the female simply bites off the head and then consumes the male while it's alive, so it's a meal. We think that sounds really terrible, and by the way, if you were that male praying mantis, it undoubtedly is pretty terrible. Uh, but they consume things almost their entire lives. They have a voracious appetite. I would say they have a metabolism like I do, because uh, I can eat all I want, and they can eat all they want, and because they eat things that are harmful to things that we're trying to harvest as crops, they're really valuable. So that's a great question, and that probably is a, a true story. This is a book written by a man and his wife. He was a photographer at one time for National Geographic, so the photographs are spectacular. He and his wife went around the planet. They knew about cultures that eat insects, and have been for hundreds, thousands of years, actually. Uh, and in many cases, insects and arachnids are a huge part of their diet and a very important part of their diet because insects contain a tremendous amount of protein. There are 1,700 species now approved by the World Health Organization for human consumption. They can be raised very, with very little expense. Uh, I've eaten crickets and uh, butter uh, grasshopper roasted in uh, brown sugar and soy sauce in Japan, and of course, this goes over kids' heads, but uh, I ate it with, it had wings and legs, and when uh, I finished eating it, I used one of the legs to pick the wings out of my teeth. Uh, and, <laughs> and students really very seldom get, get that, but uh, this is a tarantula, and this is a Cambodian girl eating a tarantula. These are Indonesian students, and my comment to, to kids is, many times I just use uh, Oreos and a glass of milk. I said, you might go home today and have a glass of milk with Oreos. And I said, that really tastes good. I said, it might not even taste good to these Indonesian children. They may not like it like we do. Their afternoon snack might be these cotton stink bugs and a little spider that this boy is collecting off this tree that they and roast over a fire. And the, the uh, Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster actually has a list of insects, and they've kinda, they kind of, on that list, tell you what it should taste like. By the way, it might not taste the same for everybody. I don't try to encourage people or say that we all need to eat insects. However, I think that it's important that we remember a lot of cultures do, and that they're really valuable in their diets. We can buy insects in this country. Uh, there's a company in California that makes uh, cricket lollipops. There's a cricket in the lollipop. We sold those at the Nature Center. Uh, they also raised crickets, and there were three different flavors you could buy for <laughs> They would flavor them, and uh, one, one brother and sister came in every year and bought their crickets. And they'd go right outside the door and sit down and eat their crickets. Their grandparents had brought them one year and they loved them. And when I gave a talk there, like this, we had some, and those that wanted to try them were able to try them. A lot of people didn't try them, by the way, and that's fine. But I do think we need to realize that people eat them and they're really important. So that's, <clears throat> that's one of my favorite books. Uh, another book that really, and Thomas most likely enjoyed this. This man has done phenomenal things with insects, and I don't know how he does it, because every insect species that he has in here that he's photographed 
is absolutely perfect. And some of his collages, this is the clear wing butterfly. I don't know how he makes these displays because every butterfly is perfect. And this book was written by a lady in uh, Boulder. It's Dragonflies of Colorado and really a beautiful book. And she has photos. I don't collect dragonflies unless I find them dead. By the way, they frequently are killed by cars because they don't fly just around ponds. We have seen them everywhere. And usually they just glance off a windshield, but it's rare that they would survive because if any part of their body other than the wings hit the windshield, they're going to die. So I find, but the, usually they're perfectly preserved. The wings are fine and, and damsel flies the same. One time when I was in Smoky Mountains, I was walking a trail and all of a sudden, it, uh, just like a, a host of blue, little blue butterflies just were coming up everywhere. What was attracting them to the... They probably had a water source somewhere and it could have been just a little small, it may not have even been a, a visible pond or puddle. And those are probably blue azures. That's the name of that little, possibly the name of that little butterfly. They're little blue ones, you said, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, uh, butterflies are amazing that way. And in, in tropical countries, you'll see thousands of butterflies around a, a little pond or puddle on the ground, and it's their water source. The longest lived insect is called, and I told Thomas I was looking this up this morning, finally I found it. I'd been naming it wrong. It's called the jewel beetle. I was calling it the, the crown jewel. It's actually a jewel beetle. It lived 51 years. So hours to 51 years. And the 51 years, by the way, is certainly an exception. Most insects have a very short lifespan. And that's why when I speak, I tell students that even the ones I've captured, they die a more pleasant death, if that's a good term, uh, than they do in nature because I now put them in my freezer. They still, in some of these golden guides, I have a golden guide up here to insects, and they tell you what to do as a collector. And they say use ether or uh, something that will asphyxiate the insect. Well, that doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work. So I, I even went to a junior high there that was having kids collect every year and told them what I decided I should do, and that was you just leave them in a container and put them in a freezer. And, uh, so with the monarch butterfly, we're looking at many, multiple generations in order to do the full migration? Fifth. In many cases, it's the fifth generation. There are several flyways. There's the western flyway, which is in California. Uh, this is, there's the Missouri flyway, which we are trying to revitalize because farmers in the Midwest ha now have killed off all the milkweed to grow crops, and so they seldom have any milkweed. And the milkweed is the only plant that the monarch butterfly will lay its eggs on. It will, it will feed on other plants, but the only one they lay their eggs on is the milkweed. So <clears throat> nature centers around the Midwest uh, in Fountain where I volunteered, we grew little milkweed plants every year and gave them to anybody that wanted them and encouraged people to put them in their garden, in their yards. And I've seen a lot here, by the way, so I'm encouraged. I didn't see any monarchs that here this year, but they were and down at the Nature Center where I was yesterday. They raised 17 this year. There's a patch of milkweed there, and when they find the caterpillar, they bring them inside and raise them. There's a fly, by the way, that lays. Monarchs, it, it's amazing how some of these things survive. Monarchs have a little, the, the caterpillar has a fly that lays its egg, penetrates the body of the monarch caterpillar, it destroys it from within, but you can't even tell that until it generally becomes the chrysalis. The chrysalis will then die in many cases because it, it has been consumed even though it turned into the chrysalis. But they raised 17 this year, and that's up from what it has been. Several years ago, they raised 50 there. The monarch population has decreased from about 900 million 20 years ago to 90 million now. And so we're they're trying to bring that up. How does this species survive over the winter? Well, that's a great question. A lot of species of insects, that caterpillar I found, that was most likely an egg. And it, or it actually may have been the caterpillar as well. It 
overwintered under the ground. And so it's protected from the harsh environment that it would have if it was out, outside on top of the ground. So many overwinter. Uh, that's why the morning cloak is the earliest butterfly that hatches because its cocoon or chrysalis has overwintered. And then when it gets warm enough, the chrysalis hatches. And something that insects have the ability to do that we don't, um, many insects, not all, can separate water from their cells. So when they're in a freezing situation, the water freezes, but it's not in a cell, so it doesn't kill the cells. So they're amazing in that way. They just have so many different protections that are just, in, to me, incredible. It's hard to explain it. The killer bees have now advanced from Brazil all the way into the United States. In fact, we don't know whether they're in Colorado. They could be. The reason that happened is they escaped from a lab in Brazil. A scientist mistakenly left a door or window open and they escaped. They began to interbreed with honeybees. Killer bees have a really nasty reputation for really good reason. They've been known to kill humans. They've been known to kill animals because they swarm. So you've been a great audience. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, well, I love doing this. I wasn't, I'm not a teacher. I have a degree in biology, but uh, this, to me, this is kind of teaching. I've probably uh, left some good impressions on people through the years. So thanks for being a part of this. Thank Very you. much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and I hope you learned something.